Hello and welcome to the second of five in a series of encore sessions for Innovation Festival 2022. It's a dull, drizzly day here in November um, and it seems an awful long time ago we were in that hot sunny field in July. So the question we're often asked is, what's happened since then? What happened to the ideas that I helped to co-create? Where did they go? Where, how are we getting on with those? And so the aim of these sessions is to try and answer that question and to make very transparent the progress that we are making or in some cases not making right because this is innovation and it's it's not easy um, but what we do with the ideas that come out of the festival we try to progress them and we work within our business and continue to work with our ecosystem to make take these ideas forward to co-create to get from idea to value that's the essence of of the innovation process that occurs within our business post festival so this is a little window in on that world if you like a view on at a point in time how are we getting on with the ideas from the festival and in this case we're looking in on the customer heroes um, the customer heroes bubble of the, that came out of the festival so welcome to this event whether you're watching live or on dave later on it doesn't really matter i've got some colleagues along to help um, explain what's going on with the various different ideas I just wanted to, to say a few things though about some of the different ideas and the quality of ideas and around in particular customer experience before we get into that because I think customer experience is one of those areas where you can never stand still and I was indeed in a session with some leaders from other businesses this morning reflecting on First Direct who are I think we'd all say are, are excellent at customer services and how they're looking at taking theirs to the next level. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, you know, the perfect uh, representation of an organization that never sits still. And we're the same when it comes to innovation. So we're always looking to work with our ecosystem and come up with better customer experiences, slicker ways of interacting with us as a customer, as a, as a supplier. So this year we've worked with the Royal College of Arts. We work with Salesforce and others to create some really brilliant new ideas that we're now progressing in our business. So before we go any further and into those, we've got about five different topics that we're going to cover today. I'm just going to hand over to Louise Hunter, our comms director, for her to give her perspective on innovation in the customer experience field. Thanks, Nigel, and welcome everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Um, I spend a lot of my day job working with our customer director, Claire Sharp, really thinking about what customers want. And we spend a lot of time asking them and getting lots of research and insights. And one of the things that I love about the festival is not only do our customers festival and we have that customer panel and an opportunity to put things in front of them live, but also they get involved in the core creation of the ideas that come out of the festival. So really, really exciting for me is an opportunity to really hammer home and deliver what customers actually want and have them devote involved in, in designing the solutions too. So really excited to hear how we've been getting on with some of those ideas and the progress this afternoon. So to hear more of that, I'll just hand you over to Angel McCosker. Afternoon, everybody. Great to be here again on another Encore session. So I'm Head of Innovation at Northumbrian Water and uh, the festival is obviously a, a, a really brilliant opportunity for us to really galvanise insight and really drive forward uh, some brilliant ideas in this particular space. And if I look a little bit more broadly about the innovation work that we do at Northumbrian Water, customer really is at the heart of that. That's why we run the event. That's why we uh, want to make our products and services better for the future. And we've had a brilliant track record of actually innovating in this space at the festival and beyond. So currently we have 15 live projects in our innovation pipeline and these are worth over five million pounds annually to our business. And at our first innovation festival, right back in 2017, we were the first water company to develop an Alexa skill and that popped out of one of the sprints that we had at the festival. Again, looking at 2017, which now seems uh, a, a lifetime ago, we started uh, working with the most wonderful uh, business uh, locally here, uh, Word Nerds. 
and we've now been working with them uh, at every festival and they've um, they've helped us understand the customer sentiment from social media with their stakeholder sentiment report that we've been using and this really helps us understand and help us with our interaction with customers. In 2020, uh, which was our first digital festival, we started working with Salesforce and we were working with them on a potential developer portal. And since that, uh, that event, we actually have brought the portal into life, which is making uh, a significant progress and driving satisfaction uh, with, the, with the DMEX score. And again, in 2020, we broke some ground working with Netcall and what they delivered for us was an app in a week. And this was all around the idea that we could help customers take better control of, of their how they pay their bills. And what the, what Netcall did with us is work to create an app during that week. They went away and built it. And then we were able to deploy that very quickly and have really quick uptake in terms of uh, how they can take control of, uh, of their bill and when, when they pay, which I guess is really topical in the space that we're at right now and indeed this week is actually talk money week and lots of people will be getting involved in that particular event especially around how we can have better conversations around money and indeed how people can get help to save uh, save money on um, water on energy and and obviously other other bills so very very topical for right for what's going on right now in addition to this, in 2020, which was clearly a cracker year for customer, uh, we started working with Procter & Gamble. And in this uh, particular uh, sprint that we did, we were looking at how we can help customers, again, save money on their energy and water bills, which can often be quite a challenge, especially in older housing stock. So this has led rise to the, uh, the brilliant Fair Water project that you'll be hearing a little bit more from Chris Jones in a minute. Uh, and we're actually able to secure um, some considerable funding from the off what fund to actually make that happen. Again, then in 2021, uh, we managed to secure some additional off what funds from an idea that popped out of that. Again, all around how we can better help support cu customers with regards to the priority service register. So a really rich space where we've really had an opportunity to, uh, to flex our innovation muscles. And we're now going to spend some time just having a look at the ideas and sprints that we that we worked on in the 2020 uh, 2022 event. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris Jones, who's going to tell you all about the uh, Enough or Forever sprint that he worked on with Procter & Gamble. Over to you, Chris. Hello. Thanks, Angela. Um, yeah, so uh, Enough for All Forever was, as Angela said, uh, very closely aligned to our uh, Off What Innovation funded uh, project Fairwater, which we're delivering with our partners. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Newcastle University, uh, National Energy Action and Northern Gas Networks. And th this project is around supporting our customers on their journey to water and energy uh, efficiency, to net zero uh, and affordability. So we're trying to tick all of those boxes um, with the sort of interventions and support that we're, we're designing as part of that project. So the Sprint was really looking very much at the sustainable water use part of that uh, that challenge and, and and looking at how we raise awareness uh, among people that sustainable water use is, is something they need to be thinking about that it's important to them uh, and raising the desire of, uh, uh, for them to to get involved in that and um, sustainable water use shouldn't feel like a compromise or a sacrifice it should feel like something that they want to do because it it works for them because it gives at least as good as the experience as as their their current way of using uh, using water so really the sprint was around understanding how to raise that awareness and raise the desire for for being more sustainable in water use and uh, really the key output to date has been uh, some great insights, some understanding, uh, experience from other parts of the world in, in how that message can be put across to uh, to uh, water customers and consumers. Um, we've taken some of those insights and we're now looking at the, the, the behavioural science behind what 
helps people change the way they they use water. So looking at their their capability for change, looking at the opportunities for change within their life and really looking at what motivates them to change. And we had we, we had some really good learning points. Uh, for example, people are motivated by thinking about their family and, and wanting to to uh, to be a good parent, to provide for their family or to provide uh, a, a sort of a, an environment that's going to be there and healthy in the future for their family. Um, perhaps much more so than than some of the things that we thought might motivate people like doing what their neighbours are doing. So, so it's some really interesting things to start thinking about, about uh, what do we need to do uh, within our project to support people to change their behaviours. Um, one specific project that we're following up uh, with Newcastle University uh, we've called Refreshers Week. Um, it's probably going to last longer than a week but the idea really was to tap into that moment of change in a student's life when, when they leave home they move into their perhaps their own accommodation or shared accommodation for the first time it's a really great opportunity to to introduce them to different ways of behaving different ways of using water in this case so the, the project that we're working up something that we hope to launch alongside uh, Freshers Week, alongside the new uh, intake of students uh, in September 2023 20, with Newcastle University uh, and, and looking at how we help students to behave differently in terms of how they use water, trying to understand what incentivizes them, what support do they need in terms of uh, information or, or technology. So really looking at how we can support them in their student life to save money and energy and water for them and for the university, but really looking to embed those behaviours so that they they behave like uh, sustainable uh, and responsible water using uh, adults through the rest of their life through what they've learned and, and taken on, on board uh, at university in that in that moment of change, as, as I said. And the final piece that really uh, we talked about in our sprint was around water literacy. Uh, one of the insights we heard from the Water Conservancy in, in Australia is that although uh, young people these days are very environmental minded and, and, and sustainable, uh, sustain, conscious about sustainability issues, they don't necessarily associate that with their own water use. And that's partly because they don't necessarily understand about water and where it comes from and the implications of, of sustainable water use. Um, so this was something that we thought we, would make a good project. As it happens, one of our colleagues uh, has already got this in mind and this has now been worked up uh, to be another uh, off what innovation bid uh, in the next round of bids. So fingers crossed uh, that they'll get that funded and we can take those insights as well uh, into the fair water project and, and in doing. So that's really where we got to. That sounds uh, like such a, a big project and so many strands of, of, of work going on. So we've just had a question in the uh, in the chat there asking, can you give some uh, examples of what sort of like physical outputs will you actually have as a consequence of this project? Of the Fair Water project, what we're trying to do is build a, I guess, a menu of options of intervention options that we can offer to people or service providers, housing providers, local authority. It doesn't have to come just through the, through us as a water service provider. List of options that people can choose from to, to, to find something that works for them, that works for the sort of property they're living in, whether they own it or whether they're renting it or, or you know, regardless of the level of affordability uh, that, they, that they have, they, there's something in that list of menu options that they can pick that will help them uh, with this journey towards net zero and water efficiency and affordability. So the idea is to, to test uh, physically in people's homes with our customers uh, a range of these options in combination with each other. So it might be that you put uh, a sort of a uh, an information awareness intervention together with a piece of technology that helps them do something uh, together with a behavioural change or a product uh, that will enable them to to use water differently but still get the same experience. Um, so th this is what we're going to produce is this evidence, this data around which um, uh, interventions work effectively and how effectively they work together and then make that available for everybody to to learn from to contribute to but most that 
that sounds uh, sounds like you're going to come up with uh, lots of different solutions that people can choose from that will then fit in their home, fit in their lifestyles. And I think uh, Procter & Gamble are, uh, inc have an incredibly strong track record at really leveraging customer insights. And I know one of the ones that, uh, that came out of the festival that again had me thinking was really the whole idea around reframing um, the impact. So you might not be very motivated by saving water for money or for the environment, but you might be very motivated about your own health. And I know one of the studies that they cited was if uh, th there's been a study that's shown that if you brush your teeth without the tap on, you actually do a much better job and have much cleaner teeth than if you leave it with the tap running. So therefore, it kind of changes that conversation that you can potentially have, which is why this project, I think, you know, is really exciting, especially with that group of partners that you've got. So uh, fantastic. So it sounds like you've got an awful lot planned. Uh, thank you very much for sharing where you've got to. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we are going to go to uh, Mark Wilkinson and Lisa Connell for an update on the more for less sprint that uh, that we ran with off at this year's festival so over to mark hi thanks angela yeah so we ran a sprint um sponsored by off looking at actually how we could support customers given the current cost of living crisis now obviously that was back in july and if anything things have got <laughs> materially worse since then so this has become even more important um i guess just before we talk about the ideas that came through the the the, the sprint and um, in the session is it's probably worth highlighting we're, we're quite a varied attendee list for, for our sprint which was great because actually the sort of byproduct of that is we, we ended up with a lot of connections of, of um, other customer sort of facing bodies that we've continued to work with so whilst we didn't necessarily um, have ideas that, that were on a long list from the sprint that we've actually followed up we, we've got a, a list of things that we'll talk about but we've actually continued those conversations and other things have come up following the sprint so we've run a series of projects with some of the organisations um, over the last few months. So that's been really good and we'll continue that, I guess, over the, the next few months. That's probably a bit of a byproduct of the innovation festival process that perhaps sometimes goes a little bit um, under the radar and I guess really important at the moment. So in terms of the sprint, we, we kind of had to narrow it down to a couple of ideas to, to present at the end. We had one called One Call, which was a simple idea where we try and pull resources, particularly at this time, for a number of different organisations together. So we gave customers like a holistic support rather than them having to contact different businesses when they needed help. And Lisa's going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, we had two other, one other idea we followed through was around bill rounding. Um, it would be fair to say we've really struggled with this one. Um, we've struggled to find a partner, uh, particularly in the bill roundup by, um, area. So you see plenty of these out there. Uh, lots of organisations are offering at the moment. Um, McDonald's being a classic one that you can see out there. Um, we're actually finding it really difficult to find who's providing that in the background. We've been out to our network. We've asked loads of people um, nobody's coming back with anything positive at the moment so again if, if you if anybody on the call um, is aware of that if you get in touch with me afterwards that'd be great we haven't given up on it i think it's a good idea but we haven't quite managed to progress that one and then i will just pick out a third idea that was on the list at the time but not actually one that we had in our, as our final group um, an idea of, uh, called beat the bill this was a kind of link between affordability and water efficiency and, and the idea of offering an incentive to use less water than you used in the previous period so that you continually drove your consumption down um, and uh, you kind of get a, an extra reward rather than the, just the bill value. Uh, at the time it was on the list, it was interesting, um, but wasn't one we decided we'd take forward. However, it's regained a little bit of a, a, a emphasis off what I've um, put out a consultation on innovative tariffs. So we think that's something we're going to run a tariff trial for next year, um, particularly to our existing smart meter customers. So I guess just keep an eye on that one as we'll have more to update that on that next year. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Lisa, who's going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing on the one call solution. Thank you, Mark. So, yeah, as, as Mark mentioned and led us in there, we were looking very much at how we could practically support our customers. Um, and one of the things that we really found from talking to partners, like Mark said, and we had a, a wide range of uh, customer support people attending our sprint, is actually our customers have quite a hard job 
of having to contact lots of different organisations to talk about what challenges they're going through, um, financial challenges or it could be priority services, so uh, vulnerabilities. But actually, they're having to talk to people time after time and go through quite sensitive information with customers. And we really looked at, is there an opportunity for us to work together and make that journey much easier for customers by doing it under what we called one call. So this was our project idea. Um, really excited that we were work, luckily working with a couple of organisations in the room who were very much of the attitude, let's just go and do it now. We think it will work. Let's give it a try and see what happens. So since then, we've set up a trial. We're now four weeks into our trial, working alongside Believe Housing and Money and Pension Service. So Believe Housing are a a organisation that provides um, housing for 18,000 customers, households that is across three different councils for us in the northern area. Um, for them, some of those customers, they collect their water bill as part of their rent. For other customers, um, they'll be paying us directly. As you can imagine, they're talking to customers all of the time um, and trying to support them with how to make their payments if affordable. We know that customers are being impacted by the cost of living, finding their bills even more expensive and struggling to pay their rent, which obviously the thought of losing a home is, is quite significant. So what we've done is set up uh, the trial working based in their offices so that we're sitting in their offices based in Seaham so that we can really build that relationship. We can not only offer a one call op option for customers, but also upskill their, their teams at the same time by they can hear about what services we offer, how we can offer potentially reduced bills, how we can sign customers up to our priority services, affordable payment arrangements, talking about weak metering. So a whole range of support that we've got on offer. So we were lucky that we got volunteers from our offices based in the north um, to go sitting in their office over Monday to Thursday, four days a week for the six week trial. And then for any opportunities that they've got to, to be able to pass customers across as part of that call, it's seamless between a team's call from one organisation across to the other with the added benefit that we can pass across the information that the customers already share. So it might be an income and expenditure. It might be details about their vulnerabilities and extra support that they need. They haven't got to tell the customer, uh, tell the organisation twice. It's passed across securely um, and with confidence that, that we're aiming to get the best solution for them. So we're supposed to say four weeks through the trial, it's going really well. We've had fantastic feedback from both the advisors that are using um, the service in the fact that they've learned more about which other organisation does. And also we've had some fantastic feedback from the customers. We've been asking the customers at the end of the call whether it's provided them with benefit. And, you know, we're finding that nearly 100% of customers are saying that the call that they've had has been easier because they've been able to do two services at the same time. They've also removed some worry about um, their finances as part of that call. So on top of that, what we've been able to do from the customers that we've signed up, we've already had 16 customers signed up for our affordability tariffs, eight priority services signups, 14 customers getting money saving advice and five getting income maximisation. We know we've still got some opportunities to build on the number of calls being transferred and we've been trialling through the, the, the weekly reviews to look at other opportunities and we've now started texting customers and also getting the Believe um, helpline to promote the service as well. So that continues to grow. But so far we've had some fantastic feedback um, and there was one particularly um, heart-wrenching story that we heard about a customer that was suicidal um, and through us offering our tariffs and getting a, a foot in the door with the customer not only were we able to to provide the customer with the lowest bill for water but actually we could signpost them across to the Believe service and be able to sort out his housing condition um, at the same time. He ended up with a lower payment arrangement, um, a meter application for, for a reduced bill with us and also the support that, that the Believe housing could offer all in one call, um, which just showed the power of that partnership working.
That sounds amazing. And it's great to hear that like all of those projects uh, have, have, have got some legs and, and are moving forwards in some different ways. Great also that Mark has flagged uh, an opportunity there, for perhaps somebody who's out there watching and knows a little bit more about this bill rounding opportunity, which does feel like something that uh, that could really uh, be very interesting for us to look at. So let's uh, let's see what we can dig up on that one. And then I was just looking in the in the questions and answers, Lisa, but I think you've already done a very succinct job at, um, at, at answering that question in terms of how many uh, customers have been supported to date. And clearly the trial has only just got up and running. So I'm yeah. sure those figures will grow and grow. A quick question from me, though. It's great that we've already got the partnerships underway that we have. Who else would we be like to have on the end of that telephone to really make this sort of like one call come to life? I think it definitely uh, demonstrated there's lots of other opportunities and even we, we did a bit of social media to talk about what we're doing. We've had a, other councils come and reach out to us we'd like to support. We've also had Age UK reach out to us and they'd be interested to doing it. I mean, my my ideal would know and we had so much conversation around this in the um, Innovation Festival that actually energy is the big, the big win. If we could get a foot in the door with some energy supplies, then I think that would that would be the, the huge step forward. Cool. Well, again, huge shout out on the line. If any of our energy friends are out there, then please do get in touch because we'd love to make this uh, this idea even bigger and even better. So thank you very much, uh, Lisa and Mark. Brilliant update there. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what else uh, we're going to do uh, with these projects. So. Uh, so now we'll move on to um, the art of smart, which was a sprint that we had with Salesforce. And here to tell us more about that, we have Colin Jackson and Jade Simmons. And I think we're starting with Colin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, we we did. We we had the art of smart sprint. Um, our, our sprint was all about the customer journey. Uh, when thinking about our smart transformation program originally and in particular the installation of, of smart meters across the operational areas. So we wanted to spend our time together focusing on customer journeys uh, from all angles with our commitment being how do we make those customer journeys as inclusive as possible. Um, acknowledging and reacting as well as responding to our customers personal needs uh, and doing so um, by for us to do the hard work rather than the customer. So an example of that would be, you know, how can we get that that data in a great place where we're, we're gathering it from the customer and not necessarily expecting the customer to have to tell us that time and time again. So as Angela alluded to, our sprint was called the art of smart. So our sprint maybe felt a little bit different to others where, you know, we weren't uh, driven originally by designing a, a product of, of such. We were focusing on a way of working or an approach, if you like. And some of those discussions did lead actually to what technical builds we wanted to make or system enhancements, um, which we are taking forward and Jade will run through those in a, in, in a wee while. Um, but our sprint conversations were, were really around inclusion and the importance of it. How can we set ourselves up so each customer receives that support that they need? And can we do that via data, via our systems? And what are the other ideas in the room? So that's probably a, a, a good place to start. You know, the ex, the expertise and the diversity of thinking in, in that room over those three days was, was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, we had speakers from different industries. Uh, we were joined by people who were able to share some real life examples, good experiences if you like, but also some bad experiences which had left them feeling feeling isolated. Um, and my my particular personal highlight was listening to an expert in the in this field, which was Kat Paler Bent, who describes herself on LinkedIn as an award-winning lady with funky heels or and a wheelchair. And I can confirm that all of that is true. Cat is award winning. The heels are indeed um, and, and also the dresses are, are funky and marvellous. And she also happens to, to use a, a wheelchair. And Kat was with us for, for three days and she spoke about um, her experiences and sharing her views. And 
and then really also spoke from a professional perspective about inclusion and and what true inclusion was from her perspective from a from a prof uh, professional point of view and that sparked a, a theory if you like that were carried right the way through the the three days uh, and I'm sure you've all seen uh, previously the the two pictures of the three people trying to watch a sports match over over a wall and those people are all different heights for all different reasons. Uh, so it, it, it's it's really about um, who gets the three boxes to stand on, um, so they they can see over over the wall. Um, and get, given everyone that that box, one box seems fair because there's only three, but that wouldn't solve the problem. So it, it it's thinking about you know what what can you do. So the obvious answer is is that you share the boxes with the people that need it most, and that results in one person having two boxes, the other person having one box, and the guy who's tall enough to see over the wall doesn't need one. Um, but our conversations went further than that. We actually challenged why the wall was there in the first place. So is it that the sport arena needed to uh, to design something that kept the fans away from from, from the pitch um, or was it that you know that there was another thing at play here that we hadn't necessarily thought about as in why why is the the, the wall needing to be brick why couldn't it just be a barrier that you could see through and where that took us was um, a, a view around how can we be universally smart and that's what we went with, an idea around how can we deliver um, something that is universally smart in everything that we do in our day to day when we're thinking about that customer journey. And I think one of the things that was said uh, by, by one of the attendees that day at the festival was we can't actually be smart until everyone's smart and everyone's thinking along the same lines. And one of the examples is really challenging ourselves around if our approach is digital first, how can we make sure that that is universally smart for everyone? So throughout those three days, um, we built four personas that we wanted to focus on from a customer perspective. We had Tarquin, who was an affluent customer. We had Brenda, who was retired. We had Angela, who um, was one of our customers who had financial challenges and difficulties. And we also had Sam, who was one of our customers who was on the uh, priority service register as well. So we focused on those uh, personas and how we build full inclusive customer journeys around all of those individuals, really drilling down into what their needs would be and how can we satisfy that upfront so we can deliver that customer service brilliantly and consistently. So there was lots of ideas that came out of it, which Jade will run us through in a, in a second. But as I said at the start, the, the Eureka moment for me was around this universally smart concept, but also the fact that when we were working with the four personas, we could all be a talk win at some point. We could all be financially secures, secured, but things change. Tarquin could fall on harder times financially. Uh, things could change for him. Um, Tarquin's health could could change um, and he may then need additional support. Um, Tarquin could retire and get a little bit older and, and be more like Brenda. Um, and all of those personas were fluid and are fluid. And that's probably something that we didn't necessarily appreciate uh, at, the, at the start of this journey, but it's something that we've acknowledged throughout and we've kept true to that as we've gone through and worked through uh, some some solutions and some takeaways. So Jade's just going to give you a bit of an update as to where we've got and call out some of the things that we've been busy with. Thank you, Colin. So yeah, as other people have alluded to already on the call, there's you know that need for that personalization from, from our customers. We want to be able to help our customers, all of them, all the time. Um, so what we did was take all of those ideas from those personas, all the really fantastic little sort of nuggets of what would really make that journey a wow moment for our customers and really deliver a fantastic unrivaled customer experience, especially when it comes to smart and that transformation. So we've we've had uh, lots of enhancements, lots of new requirements, and we've put them all into our backlog for SMART um, to be discussed, designed and delivered. And in fact, some of them have, have gone live or are going live this month um, in terms of collecting that profile data. And we use the word um, hyper-personalization, but it was also about being proactive and allowing the customer not to wait for us to ask 
when we're ringing them, but actually being able to self-service their that need of saying it's not about the label, it's it's about how you can help me. So having that information on a digital platform or their online account or when they're talking to us goes into our core systems internally, but also they can edit and look at that profile information whenever they want to, like Colin alluded to, we could all become a different person. You know, our circumstances are fluid and will change. They might not always be permanent. They can be temporary as well. So sometimes you might need help. And then in six months time, you might not. So it's being able to really access that information and give us what they feel they need. I think Kat said something perfectly. She said, I'm disabled, but I'm not vulnerable. And it's that assumption. It's being able to give people that freedom to say, I do need help right now or I don't need help right now and that's absolutely fine. So we're doing a lot of work around that profile data and building up that picture that people can give to us. We're doing a lot of um, work around usage versus cost. So Tarquin we might not care that he can save £10 in six months by reducing his consumption. He might though care that he actually by changing his behaviours has saved the equivalent CO2 for a flight to New York. So it's being able to understand and personalise that information that we're sharing to really get people to have a sustainable behaviour change when it comes to water and using smart data to be able to facilitate that information going forward. Um, and then like we alluded to, having that lens of universal design approach when all of our customer journeys. So it shouldn't necessarily be a case of, OK, this is our happy path, but if someone's on PSR, they go this way and if they're not, they go the other actually what we can what can we do to break down barriers so that everyone has a fair and equal opportunity to interact with us as a business get a positive um, outlook from our brand when it comes to smart and beyond um, so that's what we're doing at the moment and in the future we're working closely with cat and um, other organizations like dyslexia and autism societies and the rnib to make sure that we really are recognizing where those barriers might be and breaking them down and also keeping an eye on what everyone else is doing in our customer heroes bubble so that we can can we use smart customers as a pilot? Can we use this going forward? What can we do? Because we've got a really opportun real opportunity here to sort of bring that all together. So keeping an eye on what's changing and how we can enhance that from a smart perspective. Colin. Sounds like you had a very, very productive sprint. So it's brilliant to hear that you're already putting some of those ideas into action and you've actually got like a, a really uh, jam packed pipeline to to be able to to make the experience even better. I think the work that you did around the personas, recognising that personas are fluid and that nobody is like pigeonholed forever, I think it's really interesting. I have to agree that Kat uh, brought wonderful colour and insight to the festival. And uh, and again, like yourselves, I'm also still in touch with Kat to make sure that our festival is as accessible and inclusive as it can be. So uh, so she was a brilliant addition to, uh, to the sprint and indeed the festival. So great to hear on that. So thank you very much for that update. Um, we're now going to move to hear more about the customer service 2.0 sprint that uh, we ran with Shout Digital. So we have Lynn Fellows and Peter Craig with us to tell us more about that. So over to you, Lynn. Right. Firstly, hello everyone. And can I just say I have paid the electric bill. I don't know what's happened to me, but I've gone very dark all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but just to give you an overview, the customer service two sprint was all about what did customer service look like after the pandemic? The pandemic changed us all. You know, we had three years where we went through it at varying degrees. And what we found is our customers got more digitally savvy as they actually went through that. I mean, me, for example, you know, I'd never used a QR code and suddenly when my food and my drink became dependent on it, I knew how to use a QR code. So we picked up on things like that straight away. So from our customers perspective, what they wanted was easy answers to questions. They wanted to be able to get those everyday questions that they had to actually self-serve rather than waiting in a queue. They just wanted to be able to go to whatever digital channel they wanted and actually get the answer to the question. If they had a problem, they wanted to be able to get an immediate resolution to that problem themselves without having to wait in the queue to talk to one of our advisors. So 
what we had was a digital sprint. We worked with Shout Digital. Ours actually took place two weeks before the actual festival itself. It was one of the digital sprints. Um, it worked really well. So we had lots of engagement and some really enthusiastic people that joined in us who were really creative. And what it also gave us the opportunity to do was we had two weeks that we could work on before the festival. So we could actually really hit the ground run and come onto the festival site and actually talk to customers while we were there and really engage and dip into some of the other, you know, sprints that were going on just to find out where the overlaps were and where the gaps were with what we were all looking at from there. So we started initially by looking at the five generations that we serve. We did look at personas, but we actually knew Jade and Colin were looking in depth at some of the personas there. So we took it from the age demographic, you know, what were the age demographics that we actually served across those five generations and what was different about each of those generations? What was it they looked for and how did they want us to serve them? So from that, we generated loads of different ideas and there was one that stood out. As Mark touched on earlier, the cost of living crisis and obviously making sure that we were there to help our customers through the difficult times moving forward. We knew that coming out of the pandemic wasn't going to be straightforward with life going back to normal. So we really wanted to make sure that we could offer a digital solution that would actually help us to guide customers through an easy, simple journey and make sure that we were offering and covering their needs both emotionally, financially and physically. And that was it, Waterline was born. So I'll hand over to Peter and he can tell you a bit more about the actual prototype that we built, um, you know, as part of the sprint. Thanks, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, we developed an interactive prototype um, which took the customer through a really simple journey that determines whether they're eligible for priority services, uh, support plus if they need a payment break, um, if they, the fact they can get a free Leaky Loo engineer visit and updates about when Smart Meet has become available. Um, so at the Innovation Festival, we presented the prototype to a wide range of customers that went through the journey from start to finish as they would usually on like, their mobile device. Um, some of the key insights from the session were that 10 out of 10 customers absolutely loved the product, uh, thought, the, thought that customers would really, really benefit from it. Um, all thought the design uh, was user friendly and easy to use. However, we did get some feedback about that, that resulted in significant changes to the overall um, solution. Uh, so this was mainly around priority services. So we found that even if someone was eligible for priority services, they might not want to sign up. Um, so that feature was missing. And also if they had a relative or, or a friend that they knew would benefit from their priority services, um, there was no option to sign up someone else. So we actually went went away and included that um, in the iteration of design. So yeah, thanks Lynn, I'll pass that back to you. Yeah, great. So obviously we came out, as uh, Nigel touched on, actually and you did Angela as well, we came out of the festival absolutely buzzing. We, you know, we were ready to go. And unfortunately the money tree doesn't always grow in the way that you want it to. So there was that many good ideas that had come out of the festival from previous years that were already gaining momentum. In addition to that, Harry, our digital manager, had actually left the business. So we've had to wait for our new digital manager to come on board. And Barbara joined us this month last week, actually. So we haven't had the chance to catch up with her yet to share, but we will be doing. And what we'll do is we will look to roll it out and actually look at how we can actually move things forward next year. But we haven't been sat back on our laurels. We're still moving things forward. The next steps, obviously, once we've spoken, to Barbara and Dawn Crichton, who's our head of customer experience and strategy, is to really show them the refined prototype that Peter's just touched on there and actually then start engaging more widely to actually talk to more customers to find out what they want you know, the actual app to do, because obviously it was a very, very small customer group at the Innovation Festival. We also want to speak to charities and other organisations to see what they think about the idea we've come through. They know customers like our own people very, very well. So we want to engage our own people as well and find out the challenges that they have when they're trying to help customers with financial or 
priority services so we can actually really expand the ideas that we've got and we're hoping that by talking to charities and other organisations as well that we can actually look at how we might be able to approach this as a non-digital option as well. We touched on it briefly during the sprint but we didn't have time to explore that as to what about the customers that aren't choosing to use digital channels. Can we work for example with citizens advice and provide them with additional information that they can share with customers to get them to come to us so we can actually find these customers who we can help and make sure they get the unrivaled customer experience that they actually deserve from us. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Peter. Sounds like you had a, a really uh, jam-packed uh, digital sprint ahead of the festival. I know that you're part of the uh, the actual uh, physical festival as well. And great that the ideas are still alive and have legs, but obviously you need to get some more people on board and perhaps some more customer uh, input into that to get it just right. So that sounds exactly uh, like the right course of action. And Lynn, your lights have clearly come on. I thought, we were, I thought it was the mass <laughs> singer to start off with, but uh, you did reveal your just in the nick of time did. so well done for that the message to chloe must have been you know go down put the money in the meter must have registered <laughs> well thank you very much for that that's excellent and now we come to our last sprint that we're gonna um we're gonna have a look at today so this was the better bills uh, sprint and again uh, these guys were very ambitious and actually ran a hybrid sprint so i'm going to hand over to ruby and to joe from out react uh, create uh, out re recreative uh, to share more about this particular sprint. So over to you, Ruby. Thanks, Angela. Yes, yeah, so as Angela said, um, the Better Bill sprint was quite ambitious in that it was a three day sprint. Two days were held online with the third day being held in person. Um, so I'll run through the concepts quickly on screen and where we got to. So before we did this, what did our customers tell us? So Bill, uh, our customers told us that bills are rarely read. People tend to keep them as a handy form of identification. They're not an enjoyable thing to receive when you get them on the doorstep. It's a bit of a moment. Um, but what people actually want is something that makes us smile when we pick them up. So we kind of flipped the challenge on its head and said, how can we bridge culture, build community and better communicate and above all else, bring a sense of delight and shine a smile into people's days? So as we've mentioned, um, we work with Otre and Joe's on the call with us today. And we also work with the Royal College of Art, who are real specialists in inclusive design. Um, the group we had for the sprint was made up of NWG colleagues from across all directorates, along with professionals from the water industry and also from the tech industry. And these were both from B2C and B2B companies. So what we did within the sprint was we split the group, the whole group into three separate groups who used customer insight and the expertise that we've got internally to create, develop and refine three bill concepts. And we're really excited about these. So on screen, what you can see is the three concepts they came up with. Please note, no one in the team other than myself was a professional designer. So this is what we've got um, on the first concept, which is about reduced water consumption. We introduced with this a concept about where your water comes from and by sharing what your community is doing to support water saving behaviour. So this would be a real like nod towards our water efficiency projects and targets but turning it into sort of a fun competitive way to increase the knowledge around the value of water for our customers. In the middle we discussed enabling payment for all so this was about offering an inclusive option as the majority of people know when the bill lands on the doorstep it's in one type of print that's usually um, in English, it's a specific fonts, specific colours but what we thought about was is that accessible for everyone touching on what the, the guys in the smart team discussed it's not necessarily always the most accessible format, but using augmented reality, we can make bills come to life so we can make them more accessible with the ability to change the language that's used, to enhance the colours, to turn the shades different, to support customers with visual impairments, but also to have an audio option. So there'd be like a read aloud bill to support customers with hearing impairments. And then finally, the Choose Tap Water team, they use personalisation at the forefront of this to make it really fun. So you could have the dog's name on your bill and we can speak to customers as individuals while also using incentives to encourage the choice of tap water over bottled water. So those were what we presented to customers at the Innovation Festival. And we really enjoyed the session that we had with the customer group because they gave us some real clear insight into whether these would be successful, how they would land. So what they really said about these was that they really enjoyed the fact that they were fun. So this would make you smile using that sense of humour and playful language, but also that we explained cost effective measures that everybody could use. So we discussed how while tap water might not, we 
it might not seem affordable for those people on a meter it's actually a lot more affordable than bottled water if we can give water saving tips on there or explain to people that sort of you've used 45,000 litres this costs you x pence per day we can really translate your bill into actual money but also making it different to the usual bill so it gives you more information and it gives you a sense of playfulness and fun it puts a personalization angle onto the water company but also makes you feel like an individual that really matters a lot of us receive letters on a daily basis that say things like dear homeowner or whatever but this just really brings to life the fact that Northumbrian Water and Essex and Suffolk Water care about their customer groups so the next bit is that all of these ideas were then fed through to Joe and his team and they've been implemented as part of the new bill design, which you will hopefully see landing on doorsteps from summer 2023. So I'll hand over to Joe to show you what they look like. Thanks, Ruby. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess the like Ruby said, the the innovation festival itself and the ideas were were so creative and we loved uh, working with with everyone with these amazing ideas. Um, the challenge then become, OK, how do we how do we take these amazing ideas and in many cases quite blue sky ideas and uh, keep the keep the spirit of them um, uh, and distill them down into a in, in, into the bill itself. Um, now, of course, the challenge was that the bill still has to be a bill, still has to function in the same way that it does uh, it did previously. Uh, but trying to add all this value add uh, uh, stuff as well. Um, so if we can jump to the next uh, slide, first page. So this is um, uh, an example, uh, page one uh, of the the new bill design. Um, so uh, we'll just quickly flick through it and I'll pull out a few things that came, you know, the kernel of the idea came directly from those uh, those sessions, those wonderful innovation sessions. Um, so on the front page, um, we've really switched things up. Um, maybe some people uh, are, are familiar with the current um, Northumbrian Water Bill, um, but here um, we very kind of clearly uh, simplified things and, and split the front page up into uh, how much uh, you've you've used. This is for a metered customer on the left hand side with lots of insight and uh, statistics. So not lots of numbers and, and, and tables, lots of big graphic pullouts. Um, so they've used this amount uh, and, and that's, you know, really trying to make liters um, make the usage uh, more e easier to understand. So moving away from cubic meters uh, and moving towards average daily usage in liters, which uh, we know is uh, easier to comprehend um, for the average person. We then broke that down into, you know, how what is uh, 100 liters of water? So it's the same as 50 big bottles of pop or three showers or one and a half loads of washing. Uh, I'm really trying to help people understand their usage in a much more tangible way. Um, and, and those ideas uh, all, all came out of the Innovation Festival. Um, below that, we've really tried to, in that bottom left box, uh, make water usage kind of personal and, and related to your local uh, uh, environment. Again, something that came out of uh, some of those concepts we just saw. Um, so here, um, you know, using less water not only helps your bank balance, but it, it helps directly helps your local environment and, and keeps local rivers healthy. So uh, looking at personalization, uh, for example, saying that, did you know your water comes from uh, the River Weir uh, and, and making people really engaged and, and make that local connection. Um, from a kind of uh, finances perspective as well, this was a, another critical objective and, and one of those um, uh, one of those teams that Ruby mentioned were focused purely on, on, on that uh, accessibility and, and, and financial aspect, making it, uh, this a bill uh, that focuses on payment for every type of uh, customer. So we, we really made it uh, simple. Uh, this is how much you need to pay. Uh, broke down what what that was per day uh, and really kind of uh, emphasizing the value of water um, uh, for uh, you know working out how much it is per day. And uh, below that, really trying to directly uh, speak to people who might be having trouble with their bills. Um, so uh, a very prominent message on the front page of the bill, which isn't there today, really trying to target people and saying, look, if you, if you need some help paying this bill, we are here to help. Um, please do get in contact and, and there's loads of things that we can do to to support you. Um, so that's the front page. And then if maybe we just skip to page uh, three of the bill. Uh, page two is where all the maths is at, but page three is uh, another big part that uh, was directly fed into from some of those great ideas in the Innovation Festival. Um, so we we uh, spoke there uh, in, in one of those concepts about how can we get people really engaged in water use in in uh, being um, being confident in the quality of, of tap water and, and everything like that and also um, you know 
uh, understanding and being reassured by everything that Northumbrian Water is doing to, to uh, help save water and uh, uh, keep everything running smoothly. So this page is a whole page dedicated in the bill, 25% to really getting people engaged with water usage, understanding what Northumbrian Water are doing uh, and what everything great that uh, we're achieving, but also uh, championing local heroes. Uh, so this is uh, in the middle there uh, talking about Mike, who's a local hero who's who saved a bunch of uh, water um, by by installing a water button in his area. So really uh, inspiring people about things they could do. And finally, some tailored water saving tips at the bottom, which will change uh, each bill uh, to, to really uh, encourage people to do everything they can to uh, save water, help the environment and hopefully uh, reduce their bill value as well. Thank you very much there, Ed. Joe and Ruby. Uh, brilliant to actually see uh, what you've done with all of the insights and ideas that you got at the festival. And I really do hope that our bills will surprise and delight customers in a way that perhaps uh, they didn't the last time they received one. So uh, so great to see that. I think the whole strand around inclusivity, about water literacy, uh, and again, in this cost of living uh, crisis that we're in now, this offer of ways of help, I just think are so, so important. So I think you've done a brilliant job uh, bringing that to life. So thank you very much for that. So we've come to the end of the um, of the customer heroes session and I'm quite frankly blown away with all of the action that has happened uh, since only July. Uh, brilliant update from the teams there and great to hear that so much progress has been made. Uh, so I really look forward to hearing more of this progress um, in, the, in, the, in the sharebacks to come and also we produce an Innovate Connect newsletter where we again keep you all up to date with what's going on. So if you want to get involved with that then you'd be very well Welcome and we'll share with you how you can get uh, signed on to that newsletter for updates. And I guess the very exciting thing to, to leave everybody with is that we will be running our festival again next year. So that date is already in the diary. So please do not go on holiday the week of the 10th of July 2023 uh, because there will be more wonderful things happening uh, innovation festival wise. So I'm now going to hand over to Nigel who will uh, who will share his thoughts on this session. Yeah, thanks, Angela, and I, I, I would echo all your thoughts there. I think uh, some brilliant themes coming through, and it's great to see how much progress has been made. Um, I think three themes really came through for me. Um, one was inclusivity, and I, I think it's really great to see that start to come to life and the personalization of our services and making them relevant and, and you know, accessible for everybody, for all of the people, regardless of their needs. Uh, the cost of living crisis definitely came through very clearly. So I thought that was that's great to see. I think there are several of the sprints that, re, that sort of ended up looking at that. I think we are in for a, couple, a, a you know tough couple of years here, and whatever we can do as a business and and whatever we can do with the ecosystem that we've built around the innovation festival to try and help make people's lives a little easier, uh, particularly those people who are going to struggle. And I, and I think there are quite a lot of them, sadly then I think that's that's brilliant. So those, I guess those came through. And then uh, lastly, you know, I, I guess sensible use of water and as ever that sort of need to bring down the level of consumption to more sustainable level. So I thought uh, brilliant to see all of those themes show up. Um, great that, you know, you can you can see that we're exploring behavioral science, behavioral science there to help try and nudge behaviours in the right way and in a way I think it was as Chris said that that feels um, enjoyable to the customer. I like I love the idea of a, 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 a God, gosh only knows how you do it but a, a bill that makes people smile. I mean what a what a brilliant aspiration that is um, and I, th I think if we can kind of keep that there as a as a as a guiding light of like does this bill make people smile um, then I think uh, like I said Quite tricky because it's obviously got money involved, um, but um, but I think it's a it's a brilliant aspiration nonetheless to have to to keep in front of us. So really great. I think as a as a, a sort of just to close off, I would say thank you to all of the presenters. I thought you did a fantastic job. Thank you for your continued passion and commitment to keeping these ideas forward. 
what you as the audience have seen there, like I said, is a window into our world of how do we get from idea to value? As a reminder, we're intending by design, four out of 10 of these ideas come through to value. That's sort of our guiding principle, one of our guiding principles in innovation that enables us to be ambitious enough without being foolhardy, I guess it sort of feels like it, it strikes the right balance. And it's, it seems to me, you know, looking at this customer example here, that that's, a, that's about where we are. You can see some ideas like the bill one is coming through to fruition already. Others, you know, it's, it's a bit early, may or may not make it. And, and you know, we're comfortable with that. We learn all the time. Um, keeping a growth mindset, I think, is really important as part of this process. So if you feel like you want to contribute, uh, having seen this update, then get in touch. If you just want to stay up to date with everything that's going on, as Angela said, we've got the newsletter now. And so we're making sure that everything we do out of the festival honours the investment that you make in your time and, and, and with your brains, your wonderful brains. So we want to make sure that you're, you're very much kept up to date with everything that's going on in our festival. So stay tuned, everybody. And as Angela said, if nothing else, we'll see you again at next year's festival. Thank you.